Welcome to my first webinar of a brand new week. First webinar on FX Street, that is. As always, thank you very much to the fine folks at FX Street for allowing me to uh, conduct these webinars. Four in all per week. And it's actually a benefit to me, as I, as I believe I've said, described before in these webinars. Uh, this, this benefits me. It's a good recap for me. And I hope in some way... On some webinars, for some people, it's a benefit to uh, some of you as well. Hello, Roman. So, like, let's, let's get started. The purpose of this webinar is education. I am not going to provide specific trade alerts. I'm not going to provide uh, explicit trade recommendations. We will take a, a bit of a review, take a look back at the price action that's uh, already behind us, uh, what happened today, both from a price action perspective. We'll talk about some news flow as well. We take, I used to say we typically do talk about news flow uh, reports or you know comments out of Europe or somebody some US official said something whatever and then we'll take a look at had some news events in the upcoming say 24 hours that uh, might pack a punch might move the markets needless to say the general move over the past week has been up I don't think uh, any of you need to be technical technical analysis experts to conclude that let's take a look at a chart for the euro I'm actually going to take one of my charts and uh, it's a euro pound chart. I'm going to change it to euro USD and I'm going to uh, let's make it an hourly chart and I'm going to turn off the uh, auto scroll and I'm going to change it to the euro and we're going to do we're going to do that. I actually got this chart looking back to August 5th. As you know, the last week started with uh, with uh, August 10th, or August 10th, October 10th, and what I found interesting last week was that in uh, after a uh, sell-off uh, late the day in, in, the, in the at the end of the European trading week uh, in the New York afternoon on October 7th, following the non-farm pairs report, we had uh, one of the ratings agencies, I believe it was Fitch, that announced the downgrade of both Italy and Spain. And the euro sold off in the New York afternoon on that day again, Friday, October seventh. Next week, there's a, there seems there seems to be this uh, degree of confidence about that the the, uh, the eurozone leaders. And by the way, when I'm when I when I talk about uh, you know things that Europe, European leaders are doing or not doing, I do not seek to offend anyone, Europeans, on Europeans, whatever. I'm simply describing from the context of a trader. I'm I'm trying to be as uh, as politically and geographically agnostic, I think that's the right word, agnostic as possible. I mean, folks, believe me, I, I, there's plenty of uh, fingers to be pointed at, um, you know, officials and maybe corporate leaders and, and such in the U.S. as well. So I'm not all about, uh, you know, the U.S. A U.S. citizen knows everything and Europe does. And this, I'm just speaking as a as a one of uh, countless global traders out there. I just happen to live in the U.S. So my, my point is this. Uh, Commentary over the weekend, over that weekend, uh, following the NFP report, uh, especially uh, commentary from the likes of uh, French um, French President Sarkozy, German Chancellor Merkel, seemed to give a market a feeling of, yeah, maybe Europe's moving just a little bit closer to some sort of plan, which, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, wishful thinking, hopeful thinking on my part, on my, from my perspective, nevertheless, it seemed to give the market a little bit of boost. Now, we talked about some of the things last week about, you know, maybe um, one of China's sovereign wealth funds uh, giving a boost to their uh, state banks, uh, buying some stock of Chinese state banks. That could have been a factor. But, you know, you got, at least I got the feeling last week that it was, um, you know, some euro short covering. Maybe the euro, tra maybe the euro short trade was really, really too crowded. Euro short trade, which really got going in late August, early September. Maybe that was overly crowded. Euro was oversold. Too many bears, not enough bulls. Uh, we get a, a, a hint of, you know, maybe remotely promising news that you, the Eurozone leaders may be moving at least a little closer to some sort of plan, or at least expressing the, the intent to have a plan. And then, you know, the Euro has been more, was more up than down the entire week last week. That brings us to today. Today we start with, as I see on, on the front page of today's Financial Times, which I have in my hands right now, a sense that um, you know the, the G20 the G20 finance ministers who met over the weekend are sort of you know looking to the um, the eurozone leaders saying, "Come on, guys, let's get it together. Come on, let's get a plan going here." And uh, 
I'm going to give uh, some comments made during the latter part of today's London morning session. But before I do that, it would behoove me to take you back to another day in the past several weeks. That would be September 15th. Oh, Ren, I'm sorry, you're here. your TV broke down, huh? <laughs> Hope that gets fixed soon. Yeah, whether it's TV or internet, well, yeah, I'll tell you that. I tell you what, uh, you, you, going without TV, in my view, not such a bad thing. Going without internet, um, that's tragic. That's tragic because <laughs> you can you can you gather a lot of information as a trader from uh, from the internet. And I, I would argue, I would argue personally that um, you can get by with trading just fine without any access to a television. That's my personal opinion. Um, I want to show you a, let's go to a four hour chart. I'm going to try and do this, just a chart for today's, uh, European morning session. I still recall, and I, and maybe I recall this sort of stuff because I talk about it in New York session videos. I just talk about it in multiple, uh, you know, live coaching sessions, webinars and stuff. And I am reading it about in the newspaper the day after such events happen. So it just, that, that constant, I'm constantly exposed to these, these these news events and what's what central banks are doing, for example, and when you when you constantly reading about this stuff and uh, the repetition, the event just sort of sinks in, it sinks in. And I still remember, I still remember the the end of my coaching session on September 15th at 9 a.m. New York time. There was an announcement made. It was a coordinated uh, central bank policy change, or actually more of a uh, reintroduction of something that's been done by the central banks in the past. The ECB. In cooperation, you might say, with the Federal Reserve and many and many other major central banks, decided to um, uh, announce these liquidity or provide, launch these liquidity operations intended to provide dollar U.S. dollar-based funding to eurozone banks who uh, ha see higher demands for for dollar funding near the end of the year. And there were some concerns at the time that uh, that was uh, that dollar funding for eurozone banks was getting harder to come by. So, what, what, I'm, what I'm referring to. Looking on the left-hand side of the chart, I'm going to get a couple of uh, arrows going here. I'm referring to the move that I just pointed to with a red arrow right there. Left, the left center portion of the chart, that spike, that move spike up, that that jump in the euro. Again, that started about 9 a.m. New York time that day, September 15th. Let's see where that went. I'm going to draw a horizontal line in this chart at uh, one 1.39 a psychological level. And close enough. I got 1.3899 there. So there's there's roughly 1.39 in psychological level represented by a horizontal purple line in this chart. I still recall talking about this in a New York session video review or in the live class or something like that. The euro spent about 10 minutes, a mere 10 minutes above 1.39 that day. Spent the rest of that week. Actually, it's about, it was a Thursday. So yeah, I spent the rest of that week, and then of course several days after that dropping more than rising. So we had evidence, we had evidence that 1.39 was important back then, again on mid-September. So uh, of course it's a nice round number psychological level, 1.39 the price level ending into zeros. Uh, so you had reason to believe that the euro could find resistance anywhere today, at least temporary resistance around the 1.39 area. So there's, there's the circumstances. The 1.39 area held on uh, mid-September. We haven't been there since. We got there again today during today's early part of today's uh, London trade session. And with that in mind, let's go back to one of my other charts for the euro. And this is how, I'm, I'm maybe off by a, a a 15 minute counter. So this is how the chart looked a few minutes after 5 a.m. New York time. 5 a.m., 5.15, I forget which, but this is, this is, uh, after we've had, uh, London has had about two hours by this point. Uh, I consider the start of London session 3 a.m. New York time. Uh, you can, you know, there's websites you can look up to confirm, you know, what's, what's that, what's the equivalent for that for your local time. But 3 a.m. New York time, generally recognized as the start of the London trading session. Well, as I saw, London had two hours. Let me, let me draw a line on this chart at 1.39 the way I did on the other Euro chart. London had two hours to break up, make a break above 1.39, failed to do so. Look in the upper right hand portion of this chart, how much time uh, the, uh, the Euro spent struggling to, to rise above 1.39, yet failing consistently to do so. 
So that's one point. There was a technical base. Uh, the technical base is both, you know, based on, again, the September 15th price action, respecting 1.39, finding resistance there, and today's London session traders seemingly tried to break the push of the euro above 1.39, but failed to do so. So you had a, you had multiple opportunities there to go short at or near that psychological level at 1.39. Now, before I go on here, let, you, you can also you can also see a, uh, a purple uptrend support line in this chart. What's the basis for that? Let's take a look at that real quick. That trend line, as always, as always, trend lines are very subjective. Let me show you the the base. Let me explain the basis for the positioning I have for this particular trend line. This is an hourly chart, by the way, an hourly chart with indicators. This version of the trend line, you could extend it back further than the one I have. I have this trend line extended back to August, August, October 7th. October 7th low. That's the, that's the remember that's the, uh, October 7th was, it was NFP day. So the lows established late that NFP day on a Friday. And also the lows from earlier that, that, that following Monday. So those lows combined with some much more recent higher lows beginning with, uh, October 13th, October 14th, and yada, yada, yada. Now, it, it, this trend line isn't fitted quite to the wicks of the lows on, say, uh, October 14th or even Octo uh, actually, there's a couple of different lows on October 14th. Here's what I've done. And this is my way of do generally my way of doing trend lines. I, I I need to keep an open mind. I remind myself to keep an open mind about this. It's not the only way, and I, I'm always reminding myself to uh, to to draw on my charts different interpretations of trend lines. You know, just my best guess of what different traders might do. Here's why I did in this case. The trend line that I've shown in this chart, the whole trend line, again, especially fitted to the lows on October 7th and 10th. And then I go back to the 15-minute chart and give you a more um, more look, a look at more recent price action. And let me zoom on this chart a little bit. I fitted the trend line particularly close to recent price action. So when it comes to trend lines, it's it's always a guessing game as to even the horizontal support and resistance. It's always a guessing game as to where exactly does that trend line lie. Well, I used the lows established earlier today, which I can add a couple of red arrows in this chart to uh, identify those lows. Let me do that now. So look, I'm looking in the right hand center part of this chart. I've identified with a couple of lows with red arrows. I fit that trend line. Especially to those lows, and less so to the uh, the lows from uh, last week, for example. So, I, I, at, a, at a minimum, at a minimum, I will establish at least one trend line on my chart. If there's a case like this, or you know, recent series of higher lows going back several days, I will tend to fit a trend line to more recent price action. If, if recent price action, as there was the case during today's uh, Asian session, if recent buy, price action suggests a uh, you know, a certain interpretation for the for the position of that trend line. So I hope that makes sense. That uh, that's that's certainly one way, not the only way, but one way to interpret trend lines. I tend to put uh, not just trend lines, but even horizontal support and resistance. I tend to put a little more emphasis on recent price action. And you think about it, we uh, many traders use uh, moving averages, specifically exponential moving averages. Exponential moving average actually do the same thing. They put so the, the position of those exponential moving averages put more emphasis, more weight, if you will, on recent, more recent price action. So, okay, so there's the, there's the scenario. We had resistance around 1.39, 1.39 held, and we've got the perspective support at the um, base on this trend line. Uh, one more thing to note. I know I, I'm in the hell I let on this chart, but I'm about to now. I'm going to add one more upward point in red arrow to highlight the early London session low, very close to a so-called midpoint psychological level at 1.3850. I'm going to add a horizontal line there. I'm going to give it a different color. Let's make it uh, let's make it orange. Don't ask me why I favor orange. It just sort of stands out, something different. Let me make sure this is uh, right at 50. So what's the point about 50? 1.3850 midpoint, it's so-called midpoint psychological level. It's one of those stupid human tricks, which I'm subject to as much as anyone else. Uh, you know, traders tend to tend to pay more attention to nice round numbers. 1.39, a classic example, a, a classic psychological level. Uh, 1.3850, sort of maybe less so important, but still sort of a nice round number, price level, and in, in this case, in 50. 
And we noticed the euro bounced near 1.3850 in the early part of today's London session trading. So trend line in place, midpoint psychological level, seemingly factors uh, in today's late Asian session trading and early, early London session trading. With that in mind, that takes us to uh, the final hour of uh, FX Bootcamp's uh, London session coach, Kristen Stevens. Last hour of his, of his coaching session, this is between 5 and 6 a.m. New York time. We saw the release at the bottom of that hour, a little before 5.30 a.m. New York time, uh, a couple of comments out of Europe. One by the finance minister in Germany, another by a German government spokesman, likely a spokesperson for uh, a German Chancellor Merkel. Uh, Siebert is the spokesperson's name. And let me post those comments right now, at least as they were reported by um, uh, Trade the News. And by the way, uh, I'm referring to Trade the News as, as a news source, but uh, you might, might, some of you might notice that uh, there's an article posted on FX Street, which refers to um, uh, Merkel's comments. So let me post these comments right now. German finance minister, I believe his last name is pronounced Schäuble. Schäuble, I may be mispronouncing that, so please don't laugh at me too hard if I've butchered that last name. There's the comments by the German finance minister. And coming soon after that, actually five minutes, roughly five minutes later, comments by a spokesperson of the of the German government. So what do you conclude from that? Well, my take, my take, it's it's almost like Germany as uh, just today today tempered expectations about uh, what's going to come out of uh, the upcoming meetings. We got a um, we've got a, a European Union summit on October 23rd and a, a G20 meeting of not a finance minister like we had last weekend, but uh, a G20 meeting of uh, of, uh, of actual you know of leaders of like you know the, the presidents and prime ministers and those kinds of folks are going to be meeting. Uh, in Cannes, France, I believe it is, on November 3rd and November 4th. So part of the reason, as we discussed a little bit ago, part of the reason for the uh, uh, the rise last week in the euro seemed to be, of course, you can call it part technical, the euro oversold, and euro, again, the euro short trade overcrowded, and uh, the mar some short covering gave it the euro lift. But uh, if you look at at least uh, in terms of news flow, why might, why might the euro, based on news flow, have risen the way it did last week? Possibly on the back of... Uh, Maybe it's again some misplaced or, or overly hopeful, but back of at least some marks, market expectations that maybe um, Germany and France in particular and the Eurozone in general could be moving closer to some kind of solution for the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis. But those comments by uh, by Schäuble and by uh, Siebert lead, lead, lead one to believe that uh, may, that they think anyway, right or wrong, that the market is getting ahead of itself, that the market's expectations for the solution the solution to the eurozone, uh, it, it's 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 just again over optimistic, over optimistic. It's that a solution, uh, a grand solution, grand plan that's you know a fix it all sort of plan, likely not forthcoming in the mind at least of uh, the German finance minister and uh, likely Merkel as well. Yes, exactly. And well, in fact, that's the that's the term that uh, Siebert mentioned, right? Dreams. He made reference to dreams there. I believe it's a he. I don't, I don't even. I don't really know what the uh, Siebert's first name there, but I assume it's a, some, some gentleman. So what struck me is this. Let me get to the. Let me let me go now to an hourly chart. Here's what I was talking about at the start of my coaching session today, which uh, my coaching session at the FX Bootcamp started at 6 a.m. New York time. I'm going to go back to an hourly chart. And folks, I do. I've done this a lot over time, and I encourage each one of you to do the same. Uh, I'm wondering how many of you struggle. When you see a you know, a move unfolding, and you know, maybe in response to some comments out of Europe like this, sometimes the move is in, is in maybe in response to a news report, or an economic report. Sometimes the move has the move has no apparent logical catalyst or cause. It's just a move a move that unfolds. What I tend to do when I see a in this case we got a, a fairly sizable hourly candle, the hourly candle which closed at 6 a.m. New York time, I tend to compare it. The hour, to the hourly candles we've gotten in, in the uh, the recent past, like I look back over to say a week or two weeks worth of price action to see you now how big is that move in the context of uh, you know what we've seen lately in this case on the Euro USD. So let me uh, zoom out a little bit on this chart and give you some perspective here. I may have zoomed out lecture a little bit too much, but you know this is not bad. It may be a little hard to see, and I apologize for that, but. 
at least it gives you some perspective. And you can do this on your own charts. What I've done is I've um, I've I've got a euro an hourly chart for the euro USD zoomed out to sort of price action since uh, really uh, the New York session opened on October fifth. October fifth New York session open through through six a.m. New York time today. And so I, I, I did sort of a visual check of the size of the, the hourly candle, which closed today at 6 a.m. New York time. I compared the size of that red hourly candle to the size of other red hourly candles uh, going back in time to October 5th. And I could find only t on two of the occasions, on only two other occasions, did the euro drop so much over the course of an hour. And again, by the way, I reminded myself that the drop that the, uh, the the hour to candle which closed today at 6 a.m. New York time that wasn't even a full hour's move that move occurred only over mostly like 30 minutes a little over 30 minutes again the the the, the uh, sell off on the euro today really got going when those comments um, hit by um, by Schwabler and by Cybert hit the news wires again around 5:30 a.m. New York time so you're talking about a move which really unfolded over a little more than 30 minutes so you're comparing like a you're almost comparing like a 30 or 40 pip of 40 pip, a 30 or 40 minute move on the euro, a 30 or 40 minute sell off to moves which unfolded over an hour over the past uh, several trading days. And what I found was this: I found I found one uh, one hourly candle which I have the cross. Actually, let me switch to a, a cursor here. Uh, I see an hourly candle which I actually I need the cursor, the crosshairs again. So I want to make sure I got the dates. October 13th. I saw a sell-off which uh, got going on October 13th. The hour the candle is bigger than the one which closed at 6 a.m. New York time today. The other one, besides that, the other notable sell-off was the one I mentioned earlier um, in response to the uh, sovereign debt downgrade by uh, Fitch, I believe it was Fitch, of both Italy and, and Spain. So, I, again, I'm trying to put the, the, the move today, the move earlier today, between about 5.30 a.m. and 6 a.m. New York time, I'm trying to put that move in context of recent sell-offs. And what's, what struck me is that, you know, this seemed to be a pretty significant move. Again, for over that span of time compared to similar moves in the past. I mean, for example, if you look at the, uh, maybe not the, maybe that's not the best example, but if you look at the sell-off after the uh, Fitch downgrade of both Spain and Italy on October 7th, I mean, the euro never had a chance there. It, it, the euro is more down and up the rest of that trading day. Although it's not a fair comparison because it's the New York afternoon on, after on a Friday of NFP, and I mean that's a, that, that's a very very illiquid time of day. Very few traders in the market, so I don't want to make too much of that. But another notable example was the sell-off on uh, October 13th, which I highlighted earlier. That sell-off occurred uh, was a, a kickstarted uh, that the uh, London trading session that day, and uh, by and large uh, the, the euro dropped. Uh, for several hours following until we hit a trend line. Actually, that trend line went back further. But anyway, actually, the, it wasn't the trend line. It was the retest of the um, of the highs in the prior week. Yeah, that was a that was a nice uh, long, as I recall. But anyway, that uh, my point is that you know that sell off on October 13th during the uh, early part of the London session that that day, it, it had at least some legs to it. It wasn't a big extension, but it did extend a bit. So my point is this: from a from from a pure price action perspective. This this sell-off, which uh, started at about 5:30 a.m. New York time, a few minutes before that, it, it, it was it was a sizable move. It was a sizable move, and what I was uh, telling the live class at FX Boot Camp was that uh, I, I never uh, give uh, specific trade signals or tell anyone what they should think with regards to bias. But I, I, what I pretty much said was this: you have uh, the the bears, the Euro bears, had reason to believe that sell-off. For but you know by many for many reasons for several reasons the sell off the, the early sell off uh, had legs in response to the uh, comments by uh, Schroebler and by Cyber. Yeah, and I'm getting to the trend line, Money Magman. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. So go back to my interpretation of the trend line. If you go back to the 15 minute chart. We got to a point. I got a line at 30, 35, which I don't want. Let me get that line off. Okay. I'm going to zoom in on this chart a little bit. Okay. Here's the point I wanted to get at. 
focus on today's price action. This is how the euro looked at 6.15 a.m. New York time. 6.15 a.m. New York time. We got an apparent break of that uh, that purple uptrend support line, a break below the early London session low. And we already know by this time a, a fairly significant move in magnitude relative to recent euro selves going back several days to nearly the beginning of the month. And uh, you know, a, a seemingly logical sell-off given the uh, comments made by uh, both uh, Schäuble and, uh, and Siebert. Siebert, Siebert, I would, somebody correct me on if I'm getting that wrong. So the simple trade plan, not maybe an easy trade plan because it was, it's what I would call a very shallow retracement. A shallow retracement in this, in this case meaning a, a relatively small rise compared to the drop which preceded it. But the short was uh, during the during the 15 minute candle I'm showing in the lower right hand portion of the chart. A short the, the plan was basically to short at about at or very close to 1.3850 combination trend line retest. Uh, midpoint psychological level at 3050 plus retest with the early London session low. And what I don't show in this chart, but you can see in your own charts, if you, if you, if you have a 15 minute chart, uh, with indicators on it with the 5 EMA, for example, the 5, the 15 minute 5 EMA was in the same area near 3850 at that time. So that was the trade, short of 3850. Uh, this, the euro dropped eventually to the horizontal green line in this chart. That horizontal green line represents today's S1 pivot point. The daily S1 pivot point, at least what I have for S1 based on my settings for pivot points, not that my settings are the same settings as, as uh, that every currency trader on the planet has, but the settings that I've been using that, the, that seems to be, um, uh, seems to have been confirmed by other traders in our, in our live coaching sessions that, uh, and, you know, other parts of the world and such. My S1 at basically at 30, 3770. It's actually 36, 3769. Now, why is that relevant? That, that area, that area between, uh, about 3750 and 3770. Some of you may recall, that was important last week. That was important last week. I, I think last week I referred to it as like 37, uh, 3750 to 3765. Roughly a 15 pip zone. But I don't know if any, if any, any can, can recall, there was a Euro rally, a Euro rally during last Wednesday's London session. It was a strong rally, which hardly flinched in response to anything. You know, strong year rally during uh, last Wednesday's uh, uh, London session, which hardly responded to anything. Hardly, uh, there was hardly any uh, uh, notable response in price action to much any prospective source of resistance. One I did notice, what I did notice during that uh, during my London lunch coaching session on Wednesday, and we talked about that in the live class, and I believe I, I talked about it at least in one of these uh, in one of these uh, FX Street webinars, was that there was some reaction. There was I mean, let me zoom out on this chart. There was some reaction that day to the um, 37.50 to 65 area. And I'm going to go back up a little bit to see, to see this. Yeah, here it is. So on the on the upper, on sort of in the left hand portion of this chart, sort of upper left hand portion of this chart, I've got a number of arrows there, and those arrows. Where uh, errors I do uh, based on a five-minute chart several days ago, you know, after this price action unfolded, and you can see now that uh, that that day's uh, London, uh, I'm sorry, that day's New York session lows, the lows during the New York morning session last Wednesday, October 12th, those lows were generally defined by that 37.50 to sort of 65 zone. So my point is this: that 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 zone has had some history. Uh, the 50 to 70 zone has had some history to it. Even to find the lows and uh, like the early Asian session lows on uh, last Thursday. So you had some uh, an area that's had that's, that's seemed to have influenced the euro before daily S1, and that was it. That was it. The euro the euro essentially finished the European trading day very close to that 3770 level, very close to that daily S1. So the trade plan. Short at about 38.50, take profit or at least partial profit, maybe scale for those of you who like to scale your trades, scale a trade at the S1 at, 30, at about 37.70. And in my typical long-winded fashion, I took about 30 minutes to describe a trade that I'll, uh, I can assure you I'll describe in a lot less time if I do an, uh, a video review of today's New York morning session, which I, I do intend to do, unless I 
I got a curveball thrown at me from one of my one of our members or one of our coaches or our chief coach, Coach Roy McDonald. So that was it. That was the and if you look at the other currency pairs. Uh, it seemed many moved in sympathy with the euro. In other words, in correlation with the euro. That's increasingly been the case these days. Uh, you know, pound dollar, euro yen, pound yen, all, all moving in lockstep with the euro. Uh, I mean, that's, that's historically over the past three or four years, it's been more common than not, but we went through a phase there for a while where like the yen costs were doing their own thing and cable, the British pound was doing its own thing, but not so lately. In the past several weeks, as I've seen it, there's been some pretty tight correlation between uh, the four major currency pairs you see in the middle of this uh, view here. And, uh, Euro USD, pound dollar, Euro yen, pound yen. And to some degree, even the you know the Aussie USD, uh, you know, same sort of thing, Aussie yen, generally all moving in lockstep. And again, uh, what can I say? We've been talking about uh, the theme, watch Europe, watch Europe, watch Europe. I mean, as I see it, that's still, like it or not, whether you're bored with it or not, and even I'm getting a little bored with it, but not like it or not, that's what seems to move the market these days. That's what seems to influence not just, influence not just the currency market, but other financial markets as well. Michael, you know what? I I tend to think so too, and it's it's a it's actually a source of um, a fairly co consistent debate at Epic Boot Camp as to you know indicators or not indicators or not. Well, I I sometimes think that the, the the debate is misplaced, and even I I probably don't help the debate because of of my emphasis on um, on on price action more than anything else. I do not ignore indicators. I I prefer when when possible, where possible, I prefer scenarios where indicators uh, uh, contribute to the plan, the plan of the trade, contribute to the setup. Or, or, or in this, well, in this case, we had again. I don't show it. We had a five EMA near um, near that entry point for today's uh, short on the euro. But what I will also say is this. If I have other compelling reasons for a short, in this case, for a trade, in this case a short, I generally do not let indicators talk me out of it. If I have compelling reasons for a short, for example, what, I don't know if we had this, let me go to the euro charts, I don't know if we had this today, but if we did have this, um, given the, uh, the comments made by a couple of German officials there and the response from the euro and the, the apparent break of a trend line, I mean, I can I can imagine a scenario. We don't have it here, but I can imagine a scenario where, um, uh, what if uh, stochastics on uh, multiple time frames, say the hourly and four hour chart, were oversold and crossed up when we got a, a break in the parent trend line? You know, I know some traders to this day who would not take a short for those reasons. We even, even spite of a trend line break, a trend line going back several days. And in spite of news, which would which, which would seem, if anything, to be a catalyst for a euro sell-off. I mean, if, if if some of these traders that I know, I'm not again, I'm not judging them. I'm just you know just citing facts. It's, it's right or wrong. This is what they like. It's what they prefer to do. I know traders who will, if they see uh, stochastic, say oversold on an hourly chart or even four-hour chart, will will pass on that opportunity to short the euro. Will not take it. They prefer to have more ducks in a row, so to speak. Prefer to prefer to have more indicators, um, you know, pointing in their favor. But my perspective, the indicators, I mean, are just generally not foolproof. Not foolproof. I mean, some indicators work better than others. Some indicators work better at certain times than others. And Michael, if I have a fault, it's 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 my, maybe I'm watching in not watching indicators enough, not watching indicators enough. I believe I'm far from perfect, and that's one of the, that's one of the things that I uh, even I need to work on sometimes is not ignoring the indicators. And that's not it, but that's one of the uh, one of the the bigger issues that I'm uh, constantly reminding myself of. So uh, yeah, looking forward here. What what's next? What's next? we will take a look ahead here. Um, I've got uh, Epic Streets Calendar open in the background. I'm going to bring it to the foreground, put it in front of my charts. We've got a little more than 10 minutes to talk through this. We've got some data coming out of China. 
third quarter GDP for China. You know, I don't recall if that's a, uh, I think that's a second S, but maybe not. That may be a first estimate, I guess, in retail sales. Uh, retail sales out of China don't concern me. GDP out of China, third quarter GDP, that could be interesting. Believe it or not, believe it or not, uh, I'm actually interested in some of the uh, Japanese data. Japanese data, machine to orders could be interesting. That, that could, uh, that I wouldn't expect uh, Japanese data to have a direct influence per se on the Japanese yen. For example, you know, I wouldn't necessarily expect uh, broad yen strength if the Japanese mach machine to orders data were better than, than expected or vice versa. If it was worse than expected, not, not, wouldn't necessarily uh, expect the, um, the end of the week. And what, what I, what it could happen, what could happen is the Japanese data uh, due out during the next uh, Asian session, the Japanese data could set the tone for either a risk-on or risk-off mood during Tuesday. So keep that in mind. Uh, for you fans of the Australian dollar, I would not ignore the RBA meeting minutes. Uh, these, mini these minutes from uh, major central banks are tend to be a pretty good source of clues as to what's on the central bankers' minds. Uh, you know, what... You know, uh, uh, the central bank, uh, for example, may be moving closer to things like lowering rates or raising rates in the context of the Reserve Bank of Australia or RBA. Uh, there's some, been some increasing speculation that the RBA is moving closer to a uh, one, possibly two or more rate cuts. So there might be some clues there as to, you know, how uh, how close are they to, cut, to a rate cut or not. Um, it well, it, 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 it depends on what we what we see there. But you know, what if um, you know if the market thinks that uh, the, the, the rate cuts forthcoming and the and the minutes sound like make it give the impression that the rate cut isn't coming so quickly, the the, the Australian dollar could benefit from that. The Australian dollar could strengthen. Uh, vice versa, if the if the um, uh, if the minutes show that uh, maybe the, that central bank is moving even closer to a rate cut than what the market previously thought, we could see a sell off. Now, that, that, I find that could be a little hard to trade, especially the Australian dollar, especially during the Asian session. But what it could do is this. You may not see, you don't, you, even you may not be up for it. Some of you Europeans may be sleeping, not even, uh, up when those, uh, RBA meetings are released. Um, what, what I would look for is this. It's me personally, but, and you can maybe adopt a, a similar strategy for your own, uh, um, trading schedule. You know, my focus will probably be uh, maybe a latter part of the uh, London session tomorrow and especially the New York morning session tomorrow. I will look for this. Uh, number one, the you know, what do the, mean, what do the minutes say? And number two, how does the market for over, this, uh, over the several hours after the minutes are released, how does the market react? If we have a, a, a generally a broadly bearish Australian dollar over the, you know, the six hours or so after the release of those mini minutes, I'm going to favor, if anything, opportunities to sell the Australian dollar. Now, whether or not we get those opportunities remains to be seen because, remember, if the Australian dollar is weak, I like to pair up that weak currency with a, either a neutral or a, um, a strong currency. Well, what if we get a sort of a risk-on mood for, you know, for whatever reason? Maybe the Chinese numbers are better than expected. Maybe there's, uh, um, maybe some other comment out of Europe's going to give the market uh, some uh, renewed hope, whatever the case. Uh, you got to weigh the, all those factors together, and if, if we have a, um, you know, so one scenario is this: what if, um, what if the move, what if the move today, which has been risk off, is especially the con after the comments from uh, from Germany in particular, what if that mood, that risk off mood, continues tomorrow, and in addition to a risk off mood, which tends to favor the uh, a stronger dollar and stronger yen, for example, in addition to that. What if we get uh, signs that the uh, the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, is maybe even a little more devish than what the market previously thought? You know, that could set the stage for a nice uh, Aussie USD trade, a short trade, or a short on the Aussie yen. Uh, so inflation numbers out of the UK, definitely worth a look. As always, those, uh, those can influence the British pound. PPI numbers, I don't care as much about PPI numbers out of the US. Tick flows data, I don't care much about that because uh, we have more recent, um, uh, more timely uh, data on um, money flow into or out of U.S. Treasury securities from the Fed's H.4.1 report. That came out last week, by the way. So that's it. Maybe there, it's possible. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on this. I wouldn't expect that the Japanese data will definitely 
influence the market, but you know, Japanese data could be a contributing factor to some sort of either, again, risk on or risk off mood in the market. Money Magnus here question earlier about um, <laughs> change in trend versus a uh, a retracement. Uh, boy, that may be a tough call until um, we see what happens this coming weekend. Actually, not even this weekend. There's a report out Thursday. There's a report out Thursday from the so-called Troika, uh, representatives from the International Monetary Fund, European Commission, and the European Central Bank. The, the, the Troika, the so-called Troika's report on the sustainability of Greek debt, that's expected out Thursday. Uh, frankly, that could uh, be the defining factor for whether or not we get a retracement, whether, oh, I'm sorry, whether or not the, uh, the recent uh, drop today on the euro, is that a retracement of the, um, of last week's rally, or have we just started a, a new trend of the downside? I, I guess until then, until Thursday, we're, you know, it, it, it gets, te it's going to be uh, mostly technical, which means, um, let's go back to the Euro charts here. I think it's just like I showed it. Mm, I like the other chart better. Yeah, and I agree, the uh, Chinese data could be, uh, you know, and in fact, it, it's just one of those weeks where, you know, until Thursday, and this is still not Troika report, and then we got the um, uh, the EU summit over the weekend, or maybe it's early, uh, early uh, like Monday next week, I forget which, but it's coming up uh, uh, around the end of the week this week, the next European Union summit. Oh, what does that say? October 23rd, I posted that earlier, right? You know, until then, until then, the market may choose, right or wrong, to focus on data from another source, and and what can I say? The uh, the market has simply has not responded very much at all to U.S. economic data. But Erwin makes a good point with uh, a lot of Chinese data out. And I would say, you know, if, if there was, of the three major economies, I'm talking about the U.S., Eurozone, and China, of those three, I would say the story that's been most ignored, this is my personal guess, the story that's been most ignored but has, uh, that's probably not been maybe priced in effectively, in terms of the prospect of a slowdown or not, that's China. I, I'd say the market's been lately been so focused on the eurozone uh, there hasn't maybe not has, hasn't been a fo enough focus on China. So who knows? I I will. I mean, for so for example, I don't know if the market's going to respond to Chinese data uh, due out during the next uh, uh, Asian session and or days after that. But uh, you know, I will be watching for that. I will be watching for that. And if there is some reaction, then uh, you know, certainly you during the uh, New York morning session, for example, you can trade that. You trade, say, an extension of maybe a London session sell off in response to uh, worse than expected China data, or or pay, maybe buy the EURUSD on a, um, uh, a prospective extension of a euro rally in response to uh, Chinese economic data. And by the way, it doesn't have, doesn't have to be the euro, but I'm just using the euro, the euro USD as a proxy for the uh, for the currency market. Uh, what else we got here? I'm checking some of the other comments and questions. <laughs> so, J so Jack's asking the same question that the money man is. And second, I said, Jack, uh, Jack, one, I see your question earlier about. I mean, uh, folks, guys, I'm gonna tell you, I, I, I do. If you're asking me, if you think I've got it figured out, I'm just like you. I do not know. I do not know. My best guess is this. I can tell you this much. I would expect. Let's go to a let's go to go to hourly chart. You see that horizontal line at one point thirty six eighty five? I would expect there's a more than a few buyers lurking there. Maybe not I mean not maybe not actively lurking right now, but I'd imagine there's more than a few traders who will look to buy maybe it's one thirty seven, maybe it's one thirty six eighty, somewhere around there. Somewhere around there, there's I I bet there's a uh, there's a case for a buy, or if you're short, there's a case for taking at least partial profit there. And it seems like the price action over the past several trading days is 
is pretty overwhelmingly in favor of you know something happening there, a modest reaction on even on a strong euro self, a modest reaction in that area. And as I draw the um, a FIP study of the move up from the that October seventh low I mentioned earlier, that that the low established uh, after the uh, Fitch downgrade of both Spain and Italy. That uh, 38.2% FIB of that move sits at 1.37 the psychological level. So I mean, there's some reason that I'm only, I've only mentioned just a few reasons there: uh, a FIB, a, a you know, his, recent historical price action, a psychological level. Maybe other things come into play there as well. Moving averages at the time, if and when we reach uh, 1.37. One thirty-six, almost sixty, is the thirty-eight point two percent bid. If you, which you get if you pick the October sixth low. So, so, I guess my point is this. I mean, I, I can give you a couple of pointers. Number one, I think I would expect if we get there, if we get there soon, in the next day or two, it's, it's plausible we get there anyway. Uh, simply because markets move do, do move in waves, and uh, this 1.39 level has held again, and we have some commentary which, you know, say the Asian session traders might trade. The commentary out of the uh, again out of Germany earlier, which seemed maybe have damped a little bit, dampened uh, some uh, expectations, which gave the which propped the euro up last week. But I would guess the euro is going to trade technically, you know, a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit up, a little bit down until uh, either a we get some uh, a kick one way or another from the Chinese data, or B, until we get to Thursday when this uh, so-called Troika report comes out, and you know maybe that's something the market will respond to in terms of uh, defining, you know, what's what's next is are we going to get an extension of uh, last week's uh, Euro rally, or is this uh, drop today the beginning of a um, of a continued sell-off? I will say this uh, that, that, that's. If if you're to believe the likes of um, of uh, German finance minister Schäuble and uh, uh, it's like Merkel's uh, spokesperson, uh, the euro got over got uh, the the euro bulls the euro the eurozone hopefuls got ahead of themselves, got ahead of themselves. But that doesn't mean that the uh, that there isn't more short covering in store for us. I mean that was it was a pretty significant euro sell off uh, starting in late August, running through what the uh, you know, early, early this month. And also consider that the, you got, you got to remember both sides of the equation here. You've got the euro on the left-hand side of the currency pair. You've got the dollar on the right-hand side of the currency pair. We still, we still are facing, on the dollar side, a central bank, or still dealing with a central bank that is the Federal Reserve that has pursued, has to continue to pursue my, uh, easy, very easy, very accommodative policy, very loose policy, and poised possibly eventually to do more of that. So I hope that helps. But I would guess, uh, you know, barring any surprises from the Chinese data, which is, is possible, barring any surprises from the Chinese data, I just, I, I bet this will just trade very technically. You know, you know look for bounces that support. Look for uh, if, you know, if this does bounce, go lower, then uh, go, come back up to say the 38, uh, 25 to 50 area. I mean, look at that. I, I, I kind of broke through that uh, today more, fairly easily, but I would expect later we could. Uh, let me draw a, a green. Actually, I got to pick a color here. Let's see if I can go purple or something. I've already used all the other uh, major colors in terms of horizontal lines. Actually, you know what? I haven't done black. Let's just, let's just do black. Duh. Okay, horizontal black line at about thirty-eight twenty-five. I mean, I would. It wouldn't shock me. It wouldn't shock me if the euro rose to the one point thirty-eight thirty-ish area, found resistance, and uh, there's a case for a short. Maybe that short takes us through the 1.3685 area defined by the horizontal blue line, and maybe from there you've got a chance for a long, which takes us up to, well, what do you think about this prospect? Does anyone see a pattern here? And I, I can end with this note. Let me get the hot com drawing tool going here. Fingers crossed it'll work. The hot com drawing tool hasn't worked very well with me lately, but maybe I'll get lucky here. Uh, 
And no, it's not working. Shoot. Well, I can describe it visual or verbally here. Look at the hump. You can see. I'll move my cursor. You can see this. Look at the hump, which uh, developed uh, middle of part of last week. And look at the more recent hump, late last week and then today. Is it possible we get a uh, head and shoulders pattern emerge over this over the course of this week? In other words, we could get the the completion of a head and the right shoulder of a head and shoulders pattern with with possibly a neckline around 1.37 or that blue that maybe close to the blue line in this chart. That's that's generally what I would expect. Something like that, some sort of head and shoulders pattern to to emerge if. If last week's rally was merely a retracement and a broader sell-off on the euro, and Dan, I, Dan, I see your comment about pound dollar earlier, and I, I won't argue with you about uh, uh, things like uh, you know rising wedge and such. But I'm trying to keep it simple here. My time is limited. Not so offense to Epic Street. It's just it, it's, it's a good thing my time is limited here. But I'm using the euro as a as a pretty what I consider a reasonable proxy for the, uh, the for the major currency pairs, multiple currency pairs. So, folks, that uh, that's it for my time today. Again, uh, watch especially the uh, news out of China, the RBA mini minutes could certainly uh, uh, influence uh, sentiment for or against the Australian dollar, and maybe the Japanese data delivers a surprise, which could uh, bring on sort of or influence sort of a risk on or risk off mood. Other than that, uh, as, as I've been saying many, many times before in the past several days and weeks, I don't know if we're going to get any new commentary out of Europe, but uh, uh, watch Europe. Watch Europe. Uh, any new flood of Europe, can, if, if only for like an hour or so, uh, cause the euro to fluctuate. Folks, have a great day. I hope I've helped in some way. If you have any questions or comments that I missed, I apologize for that. Please feel free to ask them tomorrow or post them again. Uh, as I wrap this thing up and I'll turn off the mic, post them again and I can uh, type out a response. Thanks again to FX Street for uh, allowing me to conduct this event. Cheers.